The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I appreciate you guys taking the time this afternoon to join us for our uh, very first Native Food Sovereignty Fellows training. And this one is going to be, uh, today's topic is conducting a food sovereignty assessment. And this is actually going to be the first of a two-part webinar training uh, that will help you guys better understand the uh, food sovereignty assessment tool uh, and how to apply it in the communities where you're working. Uh, so I'd like to um, welcome our presenters today. Aaron Sherrill, who uh, works in the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative with me, and Vicki Carhu, who is one of the authors of the First Nations tool that you guys have already familiarized yourself with. Um, so, uh, Aaron, if you just want to uh, introduce yourself and say a few words, and then uh, Vicki will get into our presentation. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Erin Sherl. As Brian said, I work here at the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative alongside Brian and our team. Um, I am the research director and a staff attorney here, so I do um, a variety of work across our whole portfolio, um, really in the realm of research and writing, looking at uh, laws, and whether they're federal laws or tribal laws around food and agricultural production and trying to get uh, support tribal producers, tribal governments, tribal agribusinesses, really get them to yes when it comes to developing their food systems, revitalizing those food systems that have supported them since time immemorial. So I am um, delighted to be here with you today. You're not going to hear my voice much because Vicki is the, the real expert on this food sovereignty assessment piece, but I imagine you'll be hearing from me later in this webinar series when we really dig into some nerdy research stuff, because that's kind of my sweet spot. Um, but I'm here if anybody has any outstanding research research questions or any other kind of um, uh, questions about like food safety regulations or anything like that. That's the hat that I wear pretty much every day here. So I'm glad to be here with you this afternoon and I'm going to turn it over to Vicki. Well, hi everyone. My name is Vicki Carhu and I'm a independent contractor. I've, I was the founding director of the Muscogee Food Sovereignty Initiative in Okmulgee, Oklahoma and gained a lot of my um, experience from that time that I'm gonna share with you today about conducting a community food sovereignty assessment. For about the last 10 years, I've been an independent consultant working in native communities across the United States. I work a lot with First Nations Development Institute and also with the University of Arkansas Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, which is a totally awesome program. So I congratulate Janie and the entire staff on providing this opportunity for the young people and for everyone really in Indian country. So without further ado, um, let's go ahead and get started. So what we're gonna be talking about today is the preparation part of conducting your community food sovereignty assessment, because we're gonna talk about the foundation you build for your assessment and your assessment in turn will build a strong foundation for your food sovereignty work in your tribe or your community, or maybe it's tribe and community all wrapped up into one. So that's what we're gonna cover today. And then we'll have a second one later where we will go into more of the details of actually conducting the assessment. So if you're ready to start conducting your assessment, don't turn it off right now because you'll probably learn something about the preparation you may want to incorporate into what you've already been doing. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So next slide, please. So when we begin working with food sovereignty, and I'm sure this is an exercise you've already gone through in, in your setting there with your people, but what we wanna do first is just talk about what are we talking about food sovereignty? And so this is a very simplistic definition that, that I've come up with through my work in different settings and you will come up with your own. I can't emphasize that enough. This is just one way of putting it, but food sovereignty simply stated means that control of a community's food system is in the hands of the people of that community. You could also substitute tribe for the word community. 
So it, we're talking about the control of the entire food system. Food security is another term you're gonna hear a lot. And that, while it's a part of food sovereignty, it is very different. And food sovereignty is a much broader concept. Food security simply stated that pe means that people know where their next meal is coming from. When we're talking about food security, and this is a huge issue all over Indian country and, and all over the United States. Unfortunately, even today, one in five children in this country are food insecure, meaning one in five don't know where their next meal's coming from. They don't feel secure that they're gonna have enough to eat to meet their needs. So this is a real thing going on, not just in native communities, but across the board, that's food security. When we talk about food sovereignty, we're not just talking about whether or not food's available, we're talking about how it gets there. We're talking about production, we're talking about distribution, we're talking about a lot of different um, interrelated pieces of the food system. So you, we're gonna discuss a whole lot about what does food sovereignty mean. So I just wanted to throw that in about food security just so you're aware that they are two different things. Food security is a part of a food sovereignty situation. Next slide, please. So um, as we know, food sovereignty is not new. In fact, all the native nations had achieved food sovereignty and were taking care of their own food needs, like Aaron said, since time immemorial. How do we know? Because native nations are still here. They have not starved to death. And they were taking care of themselves with available resources for millennia before the Europeans got here. So um, <clears throat> as you know, native peoples and indigenous peoples across the continent were using different methods, hunting, fishing, gathering, farming, and also nurturing the important wild food crops. That was a, probably the earliest form of farming. So these pictures just illustrate some of the tools and methods and things that are still going on today and um, they symbolize um, food procurement, basically. So that's what we're talking about. And the best way for you to start your work of looking at food sovereignty is to, to localize the situation, look at the knowledge and the food sovereignty skills that have been present in your community in a historical context. So we're gonna talk about that more in a minute. Next slide, please. So as a preparation for getting going on your assessment, an important first step is to pull together what I call a core group. We, can call, we call it the food sovereignty team. You can use your own words. You may have a word in your language that would uh, summarize, you know, a group of like-minded people working on an issue. So you want to pull together a group of people who have some kind of link to the food system, and even more important, people with a passion for the food sovereignty work in your community or your tribe. So people who are paying attention to food, to where the food's coming from, and how it's being used in the community, people who are interested already. Gather these people together. Your team will include a lot of different characters, and you may think of, of others you know, that I hadn't thought about. But basically, you'll have some of your staff, if you're a nonprofit or if you're working in a tribal setting, then you would probably want to figure out what program this is going to go under and include key staff, board members too, if you're a nonprofit. In tribal settings, your diabetes program are usually a good source of enthusiastic people because they're dealing with the effects of the food system every day. And they've already got leadership training and a lot of knowledge that'll be helpful to you. And don't forget about your producers, your farmers and ranchers, cultural authorities. This is the people that know your history and culture, who, who are carriers of the oral histories, including and uh, much of your history and culture and your ceremonies will undoubtedly be uh, centered around food, either hunting, fishing, farming, you know, the four seasons, the, the um, cycle of, of, pr of producing food. So it's very important to have the cultural authorities. Of course, you want young people and elders, people who know how to cook, 
your daycare people. Think of any department in your tribe or, or in your community, any service providing meals. These people will be interested because they're dealing with food. They're feeding your community every day. It includes, of course, your schools, and you might want to include hospitals as well. And just think about who's serving meals in your community. Elderly nutrition, different people. And where are people getting their food? Think about that. So a grocer, if you've got a local grocery, definitely invite that, that uh, manager there or owner. And just, just look at it that way. Think about all the people who are important in your tribe and especially through the perspective of in some way, do they touch your food system? So the, your food sovereignty team is gonna be so important. They will work together to design the assessment, review the tools, figure out what's going to work best. They're going to be designing the questions and they're going to guide the entire process of conducting your food sovereignty assessment. And the reason you want this wide variety of people, so they'll each bring their own perspective to the work. So put some thought into your team. If you haven't already put together a team, it'd be a good idea to recruit some people to work with you because this is not a simple process to um, design and implement, analyze, and um, do something with the information that you've gathered. So think about your team and put together a nice team so you can share the load. Next slide, please. So um, you're thinking about food sovereignty and, and what does that mean in your particular cultural and historical context? So, um, of course, these pictures illustrate some of the different uh, traditional foods. And you know these things are still here. So you want to begin by revisiting your particular pre-European contact food sources and, and preparation methods and everything about how were people sustaining themselves before the European invasion with all the innovations and whatever they were doing it before and they were doing it basically with stone age tools on this continent so um look at that and, and take it very seriously and and notice what's still available to you next slide please so <clears throat> so a lot of what you'll be doing as you go through this process of looking at your pre-european um food sources and you look at your community trying to recruit people for your food team you're going to be getting to know your food system in the process the food system is something you may not have given a lot of thought to but it's everything that has to do with getting the food from the seed even the source of the seeds is part of the of the um, food system and a part that that needs a lot of attention so it's everything that gets that food from the seed to the table and then even into completing the circle is what happens to the waste, to the food waste. So what you wanna do is look around your community and just start noticing what's out there in terms of the food system. Where are people getting their food? What kind of facilities are available? Some, you may discover some things that will be useful to you as you plan projects and work like the kitchen that's um, visible here. In the slide, that was an um, unused Head Start kitchen at Muscogee Creek Nation that was just sitting there with all that expensive stainless steel equipment and everything. It was at a community center. Head Start had moved on to some, another location. The kitchen was there. So as an example of using some of the community assets that are already there that you will discover when you're looking at your food system, that group in that community decided to to get that kitchen up and running and get it up to FDA standards for food safety so they could produce value added goods. They, they um, sought grant money to get the training they needed and the, the equipment they needed. They got the grant money, they got the kitchen fixed up. This is the before picture and um, got new equipment where needed, got inspected, got everything done so they could start producing their own value-added goods that could be sold anywhere, not just on tribal lands. So that's an example of identifying an asset in your community, it's part of the food system, and then using that in your planning and in your work, your, your projects. So look around with new eyes, with eyes where you're thinking about the food system. 
and now we're going to go to step one so next slide please step one <clears throat> of um of actually beginning your work toward conducting a community food sovereignty assessment and this seems like a no-brainer but this one can can hold people up for a while so the first thing you have to do is define the community to be assessed now maybe you've already done that and and one of the simplest ways to do that is to just use your tribal jurisdictional boundary or um or you can use your reservation boundary it depends on you know the legal status in your area if you're checkerboard like many of us are then you'll want to discuss and this is your food team that's doing this work this is who comes together to define the community and agree on it so your food team will want to discuss whether or not you're going to include non-tribal members because this can get um, complicated sometimes if you're going to have open meetings for the public are you just going to ask the tribal members to fill out your written surveys are you just going to accept you know um, comments from tribal members are you going to be all inclusive or it really depends a lot on the kind of information you want to get so this needs some serious discussion and it really is step one because you can't talk about the community if you haven't decided on the, the parameters of that community sometimes you may want to just do a pilot project and in, in one part like pick out a, a rural community maybe one rural one urban and do assessments in those two settings that can be replicated in other uh, similar settings within your area so you may uh, you know kind of do a pilot program you may break it down into age groups like you want to see what the youth are thinking about maybe you want to to um, survey your farmers and see what's available or your um, health care workers like again they see the results of the poor diet a lot of time so you, you just want to think about it talk about it and agree on how you're going to define the community going forward for the purposes of this assessment so no matter what group or geographic definition you use for your assessment area it is vital to the process that your entire food team and any advisors that maybe some people don't want to be members of the team but they'll advise you be sure everybody agrees on this before you move forward any further Okay, next slide, please. So um, now that you've figured out your community, you can talk about what is a food sovereignty assessment in terms of the community you've decided to um, <clears throat> work with. And as you're doing this, and as you get out and, and um, start talking to people too, you're gonna notice that this is far more than a, a survey even though it is a general survey many aspects of the food system the effects of conducting this assessment go much further than just taking a survey the most important thing is the conversation starter you're going to have people talking about food sovereignty who have never put those two words together before in native community sovereignty is a pretty familiar um, concept in non-native communities not so much so be aware of that that if you're in a predominantly non-native community then you're going to have to talk about what is sovereignty because i've found in non-native communities they don't think about that they they just take it for granted however tribal communities are very aware usually of what is sovereignty so you can start with talking about how does sovereignty apply to food rather than defining sovereignty but anyway it's a good conversation starter gives you a snap, snapshot of your food system. When you look at what all's out there, you got an idea of the status quo. You start looking at the interrelationships between people and their food system, including their health and how the food system affects the community. Uh, it's an excellent planning tool for your community-based food sovereignty projects and also documentation of how community input was used in your planning process. An example of that would be if you do assessment and one of your questions is, would you shop at a farmer's market if there were one close to you? And 85% said, yes, we would. Then you've got the data to, to present to a funder to say, our community wants a farmer's market, please help us out here. So you're showing community input into your project planning. Funders really like to, 
to know that there's been community, and many of them require documentation of community input in the planning process of the projects. So that's a good one. Um, also, of course, it's an awareness raiser. raiser. Like I said, you're going to notice assets available that you might be able to use to improve the situation. It's a uniting force. You're going to discover this over and over. People that don't like each other very well have different political views or family feuds or whatever's going on. When you start talking about food, it brings people together. And this goes even into tribal programs. Maybe they're the diabetes doing something over here and commodity foods doing something over there and you know they can combine their efforts and so you'll find that it's a unifying force in what you're doing and it's also a vehicle for community engagement once you've started your projects if they've had some uh, voice this is the voice of your community talking to you through the assessment if their voice has been heard they'll come participate you're also honoring the past while planning for the future and creating inspiration for change. All of this is gonna happen as a result of your assessment. So this is important work that you're starting. Next slide, please. So um, I understand all of you have got a hard copy of this assessment tool and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So what I suggest is that everybody on your food, food team read through this, it's not heavy reading but you'll find lots and lots of ideas and you'll also um, find sample questions and so forth. So if people, if your food team will understand this tool really well before you start spreading out into your community, you'll be ahead of the game on that and, and you'll be cohesive in, in what you're getting started. Okay, next slide, please. So um, now you've got your food team together. You've been thinking about food sovereignty and what it means in your community and your historic and cultural context. You've been discussing this a little bit. So now your food team's getting excited and they wanna collect some information to inform future plans to, to reach your food sovereignty goals. How are you gonna share your enthusiasm with your community members and motivate them to participate in your assessment? So now you're ready, you've got your teams all on the same page excited, ready to move forward, you're ready to take it out into the community. So one good way is to host a community meal um, featuring traditional and local foods and invite some native chefs to help. If you look around in your area, you'll probably find some native chefs because that's a big thing right now. And you know, just about anywhere you go. And if you can't find the actual restaurant chefs, perhaps there's some, uh, people known in your community as traditional cooks. And people will come to a meal if they know they're cooking. So think about ways to attract a, a group of people together so that you can lead a discussion about food sovereignty, introduce these terms to your community. Uh, uh, if you describe the foods that you're serving and their cultural significance, that is often very meaningful to the people. You'll introduce the idea of conducting your assessment and how it's gonna benefit your own community, benefit everybody there. And then early on, right now in your introductory stage, be sure and explain why your tribe or organization wants this food system information that they're gonna be asking everybody for. Why do they want it? What do you plan to do with the results that you collect? Make it clear right from the beginning that you're coming into the community as a part of the community to hear the voice, to find out what they are interested in, or maybe what they know or what they're doing in terms of the food system, so that you can make plans for the community and that this information is not going to go anywhere outside the community. And unless that for some reason you decide to share it with some university or something, then you should inform your community that you're doing that. But basically, you're just gathering information to use for your own purposes within the community. And it's not going to be like an anthropologist coming in, taking a bunch of data and statistics and leaving, and you never know what happens. Please make that clear early on, because you'll get a lot better participation and a lot more honest answers. Okay, next slide, please. So how are you going to get this enthusiasm going other than having some kind of 
meal or big meeting or several meals or big meetings. Well, it's pretty simple. You just get out and talk about it. You start talking the idea of food sovereignty up. You talk with everybody you can think of, farmers, ranchers, grocers, health professionals. Don't forget about economic development. Often our food assessments will focus on how much money is being spent on the food and where does the money go? You know, how much of it's leaving the community and you'll get some shocking results on this because you'll find that millions of dollars are flowing out of even small, like one of the Pueblos here in New Mexico did it, small Pueblo, and they had like $3 million going into Albuquerque, I guess mostly to Walmart, you know, so don't forget the economic development, pay attention to, to where the money's going and uh, pay attention to where food comes from and share these observations with people. A good way to, to get some community response and just get enthusiasm sparked in your community is to have focus groups or talking circles to just talk about food sovereignty. You can do this anytime, anywhere, basically. And talking circles are especially good because when you pass the feather or the stick or whatever around, everybody participates. Often if you just have a free for all discussion, there are certain people that'll dominate the discussion and then more shy people will sit back. So talking circles are real good for this. So uh, also social media, start talking about food and where does your food come from on your social media post. This is all informal. This is not part of your assessment. This is getting enthusiasm and attention worked up and getting you some feedback to work in developing your assessment. Okay, next slide, please. If you're thinking about um, policy work, which many people are, um, there'll be a little bit difference in, in how you go about it because you're gonna emphasize your tribal political leaders. So you'll wanna start inviting your, your um, tribal leaders, chiefs, governors, whatever, council people, <clears throat> whoever's important in legislation and, and laws for your, for your tribe, start inviting them to your outreach programs and your any meals or anything you do. If you publish a newsletter, and I hope you do, because it's one of the best tools you can have, then take those newsletters and hand them to your council members. Put them in their mailboxes. Study tribal and non-tribal food policy issues, because there's a lot of work going on. There are food policy councils being formed. Look into all that and see how the uh, government could take a part in this. You probably want to ask a few of your leaders to be on your food team or at least at work as an advisor. And you may even want to have just a tribal leaders forum where you talk about these issues that you're learning about and the, what you're learning from the community. You talk about it just in a, a political context where you know, you're talking to leaders who can make decisions who will affect the, the community members. So just remember that if you're going into policy and you can do both policy and just program uh, work, you can get information for both from one assessment. So and don't forget about economic development because tribal leaders normally love to hear about ways to uh, get control of, of more revenue and, and everybody's eating. So there's a kind of a no brainer for you know, people are spending money on food every day. So anyway, that's a, that's a good avenue with your political leaders. All righty then, next slide. We've gotten all the way to step three, and this is just in getting ready to do your assessment. Don't forget, we're not doing assessment yet. All right, this one's probably the hardest part. You've been out in your community, you've been talking to community members, maybe you've talked to political leaders. You go back to your food team. And this is an actual picture of the Muscogee Food Sovereignty food team, and I mean, they're serious here. They're studying some stuff that I had written up about what we've been learning from the community. So what you do, you get your food team together, plan on having a, a, a pretty long meeting and maybe an hour, maybe two. And this is probably the most difficult and tricky part. It's gonna take time and consideration because what you need to do is take the information you've been learning from talking about food sovereignty and about the food system and looking around you, seeing the elements, seeing what's going on, seeing what's there to to use what resources and seeing where there may be gaps and challenges. 
now you have to figure out kind of where you want to go without having your community voice in there yet because you haven't um you haven't talked to them formally you've just gotten input so what you have to do is kind of like backward thinking it's that's what my friend and colleague john hendricks at mississippi band choctaw calls it backward thinking no you have to figure out what's the most important stuff that you need to know so that you can design questions to get the end results that you think from this informal input may be answers to some of the challenges i hope you can follow that but that's what takes it and we'll we'll talk about it some more so next slide please so let's say you're planning to work on some policy work with the tribal government so think about what have you learned out there as far as um, issues that legislative action might be an answer for so say you've noticed that people are shopping and they're spending money on food every day but none of it seems to be going into local businesses or local farmers pockets and um you're just not sure if people are happy with the way it is but maybe they're not so maybe a tribal grocery store would be a good idea this is a picture of the one at Oneida Nation in Wisconsin. That they've got an excellent food system program up there. So let's say you, you think maybe it's time for the tribe to open their own grocery store. And there are examples of this across the country because that would be a, a food related economic development thing. And you believe your leaders would probably be, maybe you've asked a few of them if that sounds like a good idea. And you, you know, you think that's gonna go. So then you wanna start thinking, well, what would we need to know in order to support the idea of having a tribal grocery store what would be would show feasibility so you would ask questions like if there was a tribal grocery store would you shop there would you prefer to shop at a tribally owned grocery store things like that it gives you a little bit of an idea and these are just some some different things that, that you could address and you're going to have your own in your own community next slide please so you're ready to start designing the tools and methods. So that means you're, you're gonna start, you know, you're thinking about questions, you're using that backward thinking of what are the results that you think are gonna do the best to, to uh, address an issue? What kind of things do you need to know? And, you know, what kind of questions will get you to those, those uh, bits of information? So another good way to look at it is to think about what are some of the obstacles that you're finding out about as you discuss things. What are some obstacles? This is still your food team working on these things. So they can be in many forms. The common denominator is anything that is preventing your community from having control of what foods are available, how the foods are produced and processed, and access to nutritious and culturally appropriate foods. So anything that gets in the way of, of that is an obstacle. So often in the communities, one of the most um, prevalent obstacles is affordability of healthy and culturally appropriate foods. They'll say, we'd eat better, but it's too expensive. But, so think about this, all foods cultivated before European contract, contact were grown using what's now called organic methods or selective harvesting from the wild. So are organic foods available and affordable in your community? This is a question. The answer is usually no. Your food team is gonna kind of know what the answer is gonna be because you've got people who are experienced in the community. So they're gonna kind of guess that, and they've been out talking to people, that most people are gonna say, well, I'd eat organic all the time, but you know, it's too expensive, or I have to drive two hours to get to a Whole Foods. There's no organic food available in my community. And even then I can't afford anything. So here's the kind of question. So you start thinking, what could we do to fix that? Then you start thinking of questions that would support doing what you wanna do. So another obstacle that comes up a lot is access. Often something ignored by the um, non-native and um, the kind of mainstream food movement 
is access because often transportation is a big issue usually with uh, a lot with the elders because the kids go off to work the young people which are like in their 30s 40s and 50s and they leave the elders at home with no car it's usually the elders are the ones that can cook so you know they can't get store to get anything so they're going to use whatever they got so access is a, is a, a, a kind of hot spot there so what can you do? What can you do to bring about a change in that? Or, and maybe it's the loss of farming and, and the knowledge. What can you do to revitalize that knowledge, revitalize those skills? So these are just a few simple examples. And of course, you're gonna have the situation in your own community. So these are just the kind of things you wanna look for as obstacles to food sovereignty, because you're gonna design your tools and your survey and your, I mean your assessment methods to uh, get information to figure out what to do about these obstacles. Is that about clear as mud? But anyway, we will forge ahead. Next slide, please. So um, once you've, and I would make a list. I, I, I always suggest just use flip charts. I like those post them, stick them, flip chart pages that you can hang up on the wall. Just start making a list key priority issues that your food team has discovered. And you may come up with 20 priority key issues that are a problem because there are a lot of problems out there. List them, list them. Then start working with your team to refine your priorities and try to agree on what are the most urgent and most important issues you need to start working on. So let's say for example, in your experience, and this is still within the food team, that the, what you found was the biggest obstacle was the access to healthy foods. So now in order to, to start thinking of questions for your assessment and what you want to ask your community, you're going to think about what are the things that affect access to healthy food? So, you know, let's ask ourselves some questions within the food team. Are healthy foods being produced in your community? Do you know if healthy foods are being produced? So here's a question where maybe you want to do a sub survey of farmers and ask them if they're producing any food for local retailers. Are they producing any food that they sell directly in the community? Through a community support agriculture, farm stand, farmers market, whatever. Are there, you know, are the foods there? Okay. Do people have access to the farmer's markets or any healthy foods? So is there just one store that people have to travel, you know, a long way to get to that has healthy food and everything else is convenience stores? Or maybe out in the country, it's the country stores with basics. So what's the access? So you just do that. So after you've thought through some of these and what you need to know questions, then create questions this is questions for your food team that you've figured out. Now you're gonna cr start creating actual survey questions that will provide the information that your food team has agreed you need to know. So uh, an example, would your family shop at a farmer's market if one were nearby? And I should have put yes or no right there. Another one, would you buy more fruits and vegetables if they were available, yes or no? Do you know where to get traditional and culturally appropriate foods, yes or no? Because Sometimes people don't know where to get them. They might be around, but they don't know where to get them. So that might be a project, you know, create a food map for traditional foods. Anyway, how far is your nearest full size grocery store? That's what we call an open ended question. When you just ask a question and they're going to answer it, they're not, they're not provided multiple choice or yes and no, they just answer it. So that's an example of an open ended question. You're going to get lots of different answers. So that makes it a little harder to compile, but it's okay. So um, create questions like this for, for your top highest priority issues. So your food team's gonna decide on the questions and then you want them to agree, you know, on the final, the final questions that you're gonna actually use. Remember, if you're gonna use written surveys, and most people do use some kind of written survey as part of their assessment, please keep the written surveys as simple as possible and try to make them 
short enough so that people can complete them in 15 minutes or so. Because once you've been talking about these issues and telling the community that you want to hear their voice and how you're going to use their opinions and the information, they're going to get excited and they're going to want to answer the questions and you've assured them anonymity and everything. They're going to want to do it and they're going to take it seriously. So don't make it a, a, a scary process. And remember that many people that you'll be surveying, they've not been to school in decades and maybe they're scared of tests. Any kind of written thing is going to, could possibly trigger some test anxiety. So anything you can do to make them comfortable and make them realize that you're just trying to get honest information that you guys can use. You're not trying to grade them or judge them or anything, and you're not even taking their names. So just, just keep all this in mind as you're creating written questions. Next slide, please. So this is an example of one of the tools you can use in your assessment. And this is a dot survey. It's the second paragraph here. And you've probably done these where you get three sticky dots and then there's a list of choices on a, on a uh, usually it's a flip chart thing. <clears throat> and you, you just put the, your three dots on the most appropriate choices for you. So that's really a good one because there's three three ways that people learn. They learn through seeing, hearing, and doing. And this gives a doing part to it. It's an actual action. Plus the dots, I love dot surveys. They're easy to do. And you can just get these little dots they, at any dollar store. They're for yard sales and so forth. And then um, they give you an instant snapshot of that particular group of people. So you can hold the dot survey up and say, look, this is what we're doing. So you ask, where does your family get most of their food? And you had choices like commodity food, farmer's market, elderly nutrition, uh, Walmart, locally owned grocery. And you've got 25 dots on Walmart and you've got two on the locally owned grocery. So what does that tell you about this group of people? Now they either they're not aware of the locally owned or they just prefer the cheaper prices or something. Something's going on. So it gives you an instant snapshot. And that's always a good thing. We've talked about written surveys and you can read that part. Guided discussions are a little more difficult, but they're very interesting. And if you're doing your survey work or your assessment work in a group setting, it is nice to do a guided discussion at the beginning because it gets the ideas out there again and it gets people participating. This is a part, highly community participatory process. So the way you would do a guided discussion, the simplest way is decide on a group of questions, use the same questions with every group that you carry out the discussion with, have two people involved. One will be recording answers and you do it by group. So you'll have it, you know, a, a full set of answers for everybody. And then you can also break it down by the different communities or the different groups you worked with. And then, um, so one person's leading the discussion and asking questions and the other one's recording the answers. So you, you don't want this to last more than maybe 15 to 20 minutes. You will learn so much interesting stuff when you do guided discussions. So think about that one. Um, next slide, please. So what this is, <clears throat> is a tool that, that I pretty much developed and, <coughs> excuse me, the, we've used this in different tribal, <clears throat> both tribal programs and community-based, tribal community-based programs. It seems to be working pretty well. So in order to get yourself organized about how you're going to carry out this work, who's going to do what, and remember you're working with a lot of volunteers, so you don't want to monopolize anybody's time. This is a good timeline to work with. The way, the way you do it, you, well, I'm, I'm assuming this can take you about a year to do a really good job on your assessment. If not, then you can adjust it. But in the middle, the purple line there, kind of in the middle, is each month of the year. Above it, you're going to put social and, and sort of political events that may affect your assessment. So this is hypothetical, of course. This is nobody's, nobody's real timeline. But we see we've put in council meetings quarterly. We've got elections coming up in this year, so we've put that in. 
then for social events, spring festival, the end of the school year, because, you know, things go on then. So you, you don't want to plan things when other things are going on, unless it's something you can really integrate with. For instance, the Indian Fair in the fall or in August, you might want to have surveys ready or you might want to do a dot survey or something at that fair. So you put things that, that you may be able to coordinate with or that may conflict with your work above the time the months below it you actually figure out the order that you're going to do the task in so the first month you're going to form your food sovereignty team and then second month the team's going to study examples then maybe third month you're going to start your community outreach well coincidentally you've got a spring festival so maybe you can you know incorporate that then you maybe you're going to do some policy work so you can get a presentation ready for the fourth month so you can make it at the council meeting then the i think the most important line is the bottom line and it says food sovereignty assessment lead person that's where you assign a, a lead person to each one of these pieces so in the beginning it's probably in your case be the vista volunteer and supervisor that'll pull together the, the um, food team from then on, the food team is going to be busy. But right to begin with, you know, who's going to who's going to start inviting and recruiting people to the food team? Probably your executive director, or in this case, Vista volunteers. Then you're going to start studying examples and study that toolkit and so forth. That's the whole team, right? You want to have community outreach. Who's going to sit at the table? Put a name on there. Put a name of who's in charge of getting some people and getting the table ready for the festival. So you know who to go to for each of these pieces. So that's how you do it. If you've already got funding in place, you can get right to work. If you have not got funding in place, it's probably going to take you, you know, up to six months to get the funding to start this process. This timeline starts when you're ready to start working. And you, you've either already got funding, you're going to do it all volunteer, or you know your tribe supporting it or something but you're ready to roll okay next slide please and these are just a few little hints for success that um of course your food team is going to determine the best means for you to gather information and these are just some examples of how you might want to do it if you don't have a chance to discuss what food sovereignty is and what it means in your context then you should prepare either a little information card or maybe a poster or some way that you can put a simple definition that your food teams agreed on of what is food sovereignty and then why you know explain why you're doing this assessment and how you're going to use the um the results so people know right from the beginning what's going on and they don't feel like you know they're not suspicious in any way so make sure you state that it's community based and all the information gathered be used by the tribe for the tribe or community. And also try to choose places that have a where you'll have access to a large cross section of your community because your ultimate goal is to get broad based and honest information. And then, you know, usually I'll say keep it anonymous too and let them know that the results will be kept at your office they'll be kept confidential once in a while you might want names but most of the time i suggest keeping it anonymous and then one more step i want to mention today next slide please is um once you've gotten everything figured out you're ready to start having your meetings or taking your surveys out to events or having group discussions or whatever you've decided to do don't forget to publicize and do a really good job of publicity for your events, your meetings, your assessment opportunities, whatever they are, because you can have the best traditional meal ever cooked, but if nobody knows about it, you're not gonna have people there. If people are not there, you're not gonna get survey questions answered. So don't forget the publicity. I can't emphasize that enough. I suggest making a nice publicity checklist. Again, I've used Muscogee Creek Nation as an example. This is the actual checklist that we had um, come up with. So every time we had an event, we'd go down this checklist 
and make sure we had gotten the event in the paper. The Muscogee Creek Nation has their own paper, their own newsletter, I mean, TV news show, radio station, et cetera. And then there are all the local papers and flyers work in a lot of communities, phone calls, personal phone calls to community leaders, just anything you can think of, make a list. And every time you do an event, go down your list, make sure you've done everything that will help you so much and it'll make your assessment a huge success. So next slide, please. So in summary today, I know it's been a lot. You're getting a copy of this so you can refer back to it. And uh, you've got my email. If you have questions, you can call me, but I mean, email me. So today, this is what you've learned. You're gonna create a food sovereignty team that's gonna design and conduct all this work. You're going to discuss food sovereignty and what means your community. You're going to define the community to be assessed if you haven't already done it. You're engaging your community in the planning process. I didn't mean to just put in. Oops. Um, you're identifying information that you need to know to support projects to improve food sovereignty. You've identified some key issues that you want to address. We've examined various assessment tools. And again, the First Nations Knowledge Center, in addition to having that um, uh, assessment toolkit, they've got a lot of other examples on there too you might be interested in uh, from communities who have, um, there are actually a few uh, full-blown assessments on there. So in communities that have already done this work. So you ought to check all that out. You've created a publicity plan and you've got a good timeline with specific benchmarks, deadlines, and the people assigned with the tasks. So in our next webinar, we're gonna talk about the actual survey work and how you uh, conduct it, compile and analyze your data, how some ways you can use the data and providing your community with feedback. So thank you very much. Back to you, Aaron and Brian. All right, thank you, Vicki. That was a, a tremendous presentation. A lot of information for us to digest. Um, yep. As you guys can see, now is a good time to start asking questions. There's a couple of ways that you can do that. You'll notice a little questions uh, box in your control panel. If you wanna just type in a question and submit it, then I can read it out loud and Vicki or Aaron will answer it. Uh, or if you want to raise your hand, um, there's a little uh, icon that has a little hand on it. If you click on that, you'll raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, then I will unmute you and you can just enter the, the, the conversation and state your question and uh, kind of just turn it into a discussion with, uh, with Vicki and Aaron. So uh, think about any uh, questions that you might have while Vicki is here. Uh, as she said, her uh, email address is here on the screen. So if something occurs to you later on, uh, just go ahead and uh, send her an email and I'm sure she'll be happy to help you out in whatever way she, that she can. Uh, one thing that I will mention is that um, we will be doing the second part of uh, the food sovereignty assessment training uh, and that will be on July 9th. And so mark that on your calendar. That'll be the second part of this uh, webinar series. All right, I know you guys have got some questions because you've been peppering me with questions for a while. Um, Vicki is the person to really uh, ask these questions to. Of course, the presentation was so thorough, maybe she already answered your questions. Shelby, I know you've got questions. Mariah. Melissa just got started, so maybe a bit early uh, for her. And we've got we've got some uh, some of our native food sovereignty fellows that have not even started their service yet on this webinar. So thank you guys for for attending. This is really going to help you kind of hit the ground running uh, once you once you uh, get to your host site. 
if you don't feel comfortable asking a question today or you don't really have a question formulated, please take down our emails. We're more than happy to answer at any time in the future or get on the phone with you, whatever makes the most sense. All right, we did have a question who came in from Kira, who's at our Swinomish site. And uh, she says, my community has done a phase one food assessment and got a lot of resistance from food providers not wanting to answer questions about what they serve. How do I approach them a second time? That's a great wow, that, that's, that's interesting. That's um, a great question. Yeah, I've not heard that one before. So um, something must have made them uncomfortable, obviously. I don't know what that might have been, but you would I would say go to the people who had, who had expressed the concern and meet with them face to face and ask them, you know, what's bothering them and ask for, in fact, ask them to join your food team and help design the, the methods that you use and the tools that you use and just see if you can work it out. Because if that's important information you need to know, then, um, Somehow, maybe you can come to agreement by including the people who are having a problem with it in the pr planning process. I think that would be the first thing I would try. Yeah, Aaron, do you have a, a take on that? No, I think Vicki's right on. Um, I, I think inviting people into the conversation to actually join the team is a good way to, to go about that. Um, and you know, I mean, sometimes people may just not want want to come back and that's that's another reality too but hopefully vicky's approach will get you there it, it sounds like maybe they're a little defensive like they think they're going to sure. get criticized somehow sure. so you want to make them feel comfortable that that's not what you're up to that you know you're just innocently trying to find out real information that can help everybody Sure, and, and one of the, the concerns I know about doing any kind of assessment um, in tribal communities is, is really the control of that data, because I think people have just been studied to death. Mm -hmm. um, so they may have had a bad experience with somebody who's not remotely related to you, um, and they're just sour on the whole kind of process after that. Like they may have shared something that they thought would have been private, and then it wasn't. Um, so that's, that's just a reality that you should probably keep in mind when you're doing this work too. Yeah, that's a good right. point. Yeah, that's why I emphasize until people just get tired of hearing it to, you know, tell the community why you're doing this, what you're going to do with the information, and even where it's going to be stored and how Absolutely. they gain access to it and, and how you're going to, you know, decide who gets access. Because that's up to you as your nonprofit or your tribe. You control this data. So, you share it with who you want to share it with. So That's right. People need to understand that. Shelby, uh, I'm going to unmute you and I'd like for you to, uh, um, if you don't mind, share your story about your uh, uh, dot survey that you did. Cool. If I can unmute you. Maybe I can't unmute you. Okay. This is not allowing me to do that. Okay. Uh, but Shelby did send in a question. So um, she says, in our first meeting, we decided we wanted to include the whole community, not just the tribal community, but we want to focus on traditional foods and agricultural practices. How do we make sure this won't be offensive to non-tribal members? Oh, that's a new question. Um, I've really never heard of something being offensive to non-tribal members in terms of questions about traditional foods. So I don't know your situation and every community is different. So um, 
this is where your food team really is important. And if you're going to be the, um, you know, including everyone in your community, then have some non-tribal members on your food team so that you can ask them and, and you know, get their um, opinion before you use the questions. I don't know. I've, I've never heard of people offend, being offended. Often the, the non-tribal members who are involved in a native community are going to be people who are married into native families or somehow closely involved in the community. Maybe they're tribal employees, but they've been there a long time. And, and you know, a lot of times they're just as interested in the traditional foods as everybody else is. It's the tribal members. In fact, I knew one at, um, in Oklahoma, I knew a non-tribal member that was sought after because of how well she could cook. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this, this happened. Yeah, I think all tribal communities know that person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you want that person on your food team, by the way. Yeah. They're good. They're good ones. So uh, one thing that I will remind everyone is if you look in the handouts portion of your control panel, uh, today's presentation is there as a PDF document, and that way you have access to all these slides if you want to refer to them later. And also uh, the uh, First Nations uh, Food Sovereignty Assessment Tool is there if you don't already have it. Okay, any other questions? Well, we've got uh, Vicki. Uh, you'll need to uh, type them into your questions box because for some reason, um, my, uh, my functionality is locked out. I'm not able to unmute people for some reason. I think it might be a glitch in the software. But I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Uh, Aaron or Vicki, do you have any final thoughts before we uh, close out today's webinar? Well, I'm just uh, glad to know you're doing this across Indian country through Vista Volunteers. And I wish you all the best and can't wait to hear about some of your results and maybe get to you can share some of your surveys and everything. Because I'm very, very glad you're doing this. You're going to be glad, too, once you have this information. So thank you very much for being here today and taking on this work. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I want to reiterate what Vicki said and thank you for your service. And I look forward to seeing the work that you bring and the support that you bring to the communities that you're serving. I think you're doing really great work. And please, like I said, just if, you have got a, if you've got a question that comes to you immediately after you close out of this webinar, our email addresses are on the screen. Reach out anytime. All right, so I'll go ahead and conclude today's webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending, and especially thank you, Vicki and Aaron, for presenting for us today. Uh, there's a lot of information for us to digest, and uh, we're going to take this information and run with it uh, and really uh, get started on our, uh, on our assessments, and uh, hopefully we'll have some good progress to report back when we uh, – revisit this issue on uh, in our July training. So thanks everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Have a good weekend and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thanks a lot. Happy Friday. Bye everybody. Have a good weekend. Yep.